The first reading is from Daniel 7, Daniel's dream of four beasts. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying in bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came out of the sea. The first was like a lion and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a human being and the mind of a human was given to it. And there before me was a second beast which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underfoot whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts and it had 10 horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a human being and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, it said, thrones were set in place and the ancient of days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousand upon thousands attended him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. The second reading is from Matthew chapter 16. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah. When Jesus came to the re re region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you key, the keys of the kingdom of heaven Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you so much for that beautiful reading, even though the passage was not easy to understand and some of the words that we don't want to read often. But anyway, our God is good. And uh, good morning, everyone, again. And thank you so much for having me. And I'm really honored to stand here before you. Uh, I don't feel adequate preaching like this, uh, but this is an opportunity I received uh, to share how God has worked in our lives and to encourage you this morning. And uh, as we go through the reading, you can see some of the things that has been said about Jesus and coming and being fulfilled in him and uh, through his life. Today we can see how we can understand the message and how we can live the message. When I was thinking about these passages, I was thinking when Jesus came on earth, he wasn't just sharing the message, but he was living the message. And that's what he is telling us to do um, in this moment. As many of you know uh, now, uh, my name is Susma and I'm married to Milan. We have three daughters. One is 18, one is just 11 today, and one is seven years old. And we have been serving God since 20 years. And we have been a very good partner with uh, Warfield Church since those days. And I want to thank you again uh, for partnering with us, praying for us, encouraging us, visiting us, and coming and supporting in all we are doing. And even though it seems like we are doing many things in Nepal, but actually it's our partnership. The work God is doing in Nepal, you are part of it. So I want to thank you before I start um, what I have in my heart to share this morning. I, when I heard um, from Dave what you are going through as a church and what is the ch subject you are looking, and I was really excited. You are focusing your eyes on Jesus, and what better other things can be more than that? And you were focusing on Jesus as a son of God, as a son of man, and as a son of Abraham, and um, as son of David. And it's all, when it all comes together, we got the whole picture. And today I'm going to focus more on humanity of our Lord Jesus. And that gives us so much hope again to follow him. And uh, my heart is full of joy. And uh, when Jesus was talking about that, um, we see in the first slide, if it is on, yes, uh, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, it was God's idea when man failed to send a son who is a promised son to get, out of, uh, get, to get us out from the pit that we fall into. So he promised a son, one um, human, that he will come and trample. And Genesis 3.15, it is written that I will put enmity between you and the woman and the between your offspring and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. He's talking to the servant who put mankind in trouble. And that was his promise. And when Jesus came on earth, when he, Jesus was introducing himself, we see him, people talk, people received him as a rabbi or son of God. We, uh, we heard earlier that when Peter had a revelation, Jesus asked him, who people say I am? Who people say this son of man is? And um, when Peter had the revelation from God, he was saying, you are the Messiah, the son of God. And that revelation, but Jesus himself was comfortable to say himself that I am the son of man. And actually God sent him, Jesus came and introduced himself to all the humanity that were around as son of man. And uh, we will see later that he used this term over 80 times that he was the son of man. And when he was saying that, we will see a little bit later, but in terms of the um, meaning of son of man, in Hebrew it is called ben Adam, and that means son 
of man or son of Adam. And um, in various translations, I was looking and uh, some of the texts that I received from the church, and there were most of the translations say the son of man, but one translation, CEB translation says the human one. And I found um, one translation said um, uh, the American Standard Version, the son in capital letter, but man in small letter. Otherwise, all the translation says the son of man in capital letter. And uh, this is to signify that there is something important you and I can look and follow. And that's what I found. Um, and when he came, he fulfilled uh, the word God gave in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. If you go to slide, two, uh, slide second, we can see the different images that we read about earlier. In chapter 2 and chapter 7, there is a king about kingdom in a statue and in a beastly form. It has been said different kingdoms were coming to rule the earth and different, different kinds of uh, governors were coming, kings were coming, but they were all talking about one coming kingdom who will overcome them all. In chapter 3 and chapter 6, we see God saving his people. People. We see in his kingdom there is protection, there is grace, there is miracle, and there is God's intervention in our everyday life as we see Shraddak, Meshach, and Abedango being saved from the fire, as we see Daniel being saved from the lion's den. And when we go to chapter 4 and chapter 5, there is another kind of beastly uh, creatures in the Bible. But all of these are saying, and I can relate to my country. If we see the history, maybe you can relate to your history as well. When people came to rule and reign, they were bloodshed. They were... Um, um, they, they just had uh, so much desire for the power and to receive the power. They were killing and shedding bloods. They were, um, you know, offering children and people. They trampled over people to get the power. And that is the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of the evil. But the kingdom of Jesus, the Son of Man, who came to establish the kingdom of heaven, that kingdom is full of light, full of love, full of hope, full of uh, forgiveness. And it has peace and righteousness and joy. This is a completely different kingdom that Jesus came to establish. And when Jesus was saying to the Jews and all his disciples, that son of man, I, Ben Adam, I, in Aramaic, Ben Enosha, I, human, son of man, he was actually quoting, I am the promised one in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I am the son of man that has been talked about in Daniel chapter 7 and 13 and verse 14. We see all the beastly things we read and then the ancient of days, our father God sitting on his throne and Jesus is brought into his presence. And 13 and verse, verse 14, we see the kingdom has been given to him. All the power, all the glory, all the dominion is given to Jesus. And because he has overcome all those beastly things. And our king, our Lord, our son of man, who came to save us. And actually he was saying, I am here to rescue you from the pit the humanity had fallen. I am here to win back the kingdom that has been taken from you. Now it belongs to me. And in you, you can have that kingdom. You can live with me. You can reign with me. And this is the gospel. This is the great gospel we cannot find in any other, any other places in any other gods that men have made themselves. But in Jesus, we see he was clearly saying, I am the promised one. I am the prophesied one. And in me, you have, in the third slide we see, in me, you have the kingdom back. And that's how we can say that my sins are forgiven. I am no longer in bondage. And in his Kingdom, we have freedom, we have joy, we have forgiveness, we have peace, we have grace overall in every circumstances, and we can follow him. And uh, actually, the Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, Jesus quotes that verse when he was brought into 
um, Sanhedrin, when they were, the high priest Caiaphas was there, his council were there, all the Jewish supreme council were there, and they were questioning him. Are you the son of God? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one? And when they were saying, he answers like, you will, from now on, you will see me sitting at the right hand of the Almighty and coming in the cloud. And actually, he was picturing that and saying to the high priest, and then the high priest, what he does, he tears his clothes and he says, this is blasphemy. We don't need any other evidence. We don't need any other guilt. He is condemned to death. And that's why, that is the very reason they take our Lord to the cross. And it had to happen for our freedom. Somebody had to die for our freedom. Somebody had to shed the blood for your and my sin. And he did it. And he was not afraid to say who he was. And when Jesus was saying, I am the son of man, he wasn't just saying, I am vulnerable like you. I have become one of you. He was saying, I, ha I am the promised one. I am the one who will overcome the world and win the kingdom and bring back to you. Then you can rule and reign with me. And it's the good news in the son of man. And the last slide I want to share with you is our identity in his humanity. Hallelujah. This is the way I do in my church. You can say hallelujah with me. Hallelujah. hallelujah. It keeps me encouraging because it is a news of hallelujah because the kingdom that has been taken away from us, actually Jesus had won it back and it will come in its fullness when he comes back to rule and reign. And he will come back when there are enough people to say, come Lord Jesus, come. We are ready. We have shared the good news. We have seen the darkness and we have signed your light. Now you can come. And that's what we are doing through our humanitarian work. And I always get encouraged by church in Warfi. You are doing reading and praying and reaching out, church planting and feeding the poor and supporting people like us in Nepal, in other nations as well. Thank Thank you for doing that. This is sharing the gospel. You may not go in our country and difficult places, but we are there and you are with us and you are supporting us because we want to bring more people to say, come Lord Jesus, come. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for joining me. So in God's, in Jesus' humanity, I saw our identity in two ways. Number one, legal access. Because Jesus came as a human being, we have a representative, a perfect human who have been sacrificed. So we can say now, yes, we were sinners, but one man has died and now we are righteous in him because he took our sin. So legally, being human, Jesus legally won us back. And his kingdom is a righteous kingdom. He does everything fairly. Even to will the evil, he has come legally as a human being. In John chapter 1, verse 14, we see the word became flesh and dwell among us. He needed that flesh. He needed that body because you and I are in the body. And he took that place. And this morning when David was uh, reading from Philippians chapter 2, that he humbled himself. And Dave was praying. I found that so powerful. Jesus humbled himself to wash his disciples' feet. You know, the humanity, the, the, the best picture of Jesus' humanity is seen in that scene. He's washing his disciples' feet because even he was not just a man, he was God. But he was doing that in, in, hum, in, hum, uh, in his um, humbleness. So this is Jesus who made us his legally redeemed us. And we read about that in uh, Matthew chapter 20, John 1, 1 29, that when the John the Baptist see Jesus coming towards him, he says, look, the lamb who is going to take the sin of the world. He came as a lamb, and lamb in human form because he was freeing people, and he became that people, that human. And John the Baptist prophesies that, declares that. And Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, we read about um, the importance of the blood, and it is written, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Without the shedding of the blood, there is no forgiveness. So Jesus was there to shed blood for us so that our sins will be forgiven. And Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 10, if we read, he was sacrificed 
once for all so that we all can be righteous in him. Our sin he took and his righteousness he gave. What a great exchange we have received in him. So legally, he redeemed us. And number two, credibility to follow Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We can follow him because if he had come as a God, we wouldn't be able to follow him because he had all the power. But Jesus showed us the way that he came as a human. And now we can say, Jesus did that. Maybe I can also, by the power of the Holy Spirit, depending like him on Father, I can do that, and I can pray, I can speak peace, I can share hope. And in the world around us today, there's so much things going on. You may have read uh, the news about Nepal this morning, the plane crash, and the war in the Ukraine. It's nearly going to be one year. The unfairness in Myanmar, and the, such a dark time in Afghanistan and North Korea, and all the things that is going around the world, we can feel like, what's going on? Where is God? You know, there's so much when we start to talk about, it can just press us down. But when we look to Jesus and remember those beasts, how powerful and how vivid and how dangerous, terrifying their picture is. However, our Lord's kingdom is advancing. And his kingdom is light and love and forgiveness and victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus has won the battle. And his, its fullness is coming. And as a church, you and me, however there is danger, however there is famine, there is war, there is hopelessness, everything is rising high and life is so difficult. But we look to Jesus and we can say, I can speak peace because Jesus has won the battle. I can follow him in that when we go through cancer, when we go through difficult diseases in our body, in our family, in our church. And we, sometimes I don't have word how to counsel people. But still in the name of Jesus, I can touch and speak my faith in Jesus' name. Because he bear the stripes in his body by his wind, wound, you are healed. I can pray that because of Jesus, because of his humanity. He showed us the way. So there is credibility for us to follow him. And if he hadn't risen, we have 33 million gods in Nepal. People are searching. They are so devoted. They fast a lot. They go in different dangerous places to worship. They are searching. But actually, in Jesus only, there is hope. And in Jesus only, I find peace. In Jesus only, I can have relationship. Because in other religion or the, the culture I come from, God is big and terrifying. And we want to please him. But there is no relationship. Because they haven't become men. But our Lord, he came as a human. So I can follow him. And I can say he understands. And one family in our church, well, the pastor I knew, my husband knew very well, their 11-year son committed suicide. And it was such a difficult situation to go and to talk to them. And you know, in that situation, the pastor himself said, now I know how it feels to lose your son. And that's what our God did. And we didn't have to speak anything. God was already healing them. The dreadful thing happened in the family, but because of Jesus, because of his sacrifice, they were able to counsel themselves and look to God in that moment. And we had a people coming to our church who were going through cancer. And he only had a few months to leave. And I didn't know how to pray for him. And we were praying and asking God and trying to support him for medical treatment and things like that. And at the end of the day, before he died, we were there to uh, meet him uh, in hospice. And we were, and we were praying. We, were, we ran out of word. And in that very moment, we're just praying in tongues, asking the Holy Spirit to come and minister that brother. He was only 21. His wife was 19, and they had a toddler with, with them. And it was so hard to see in that family. But, you know, as we were praying and God's peace was there and the guy started to cry. He had tumor in his mouth. He wasn't very able to speak fluently. But he started to cry, and after the prayer, I said, Brother, why, why are you crying? What happened to you? And he said, Sister Susma, Jesus came into this room, and he stood before me, 
And I was like, how did you feel? What did he tell you? I wanted to know. And the, and the guy said, he did not speak anything. He just looked into my eyes, and he went behind me, and he's still standing there. We were five people in the room, and we all were filled with goosebumps. And we could feel the sense of our Jesus presence because he's alive and he's human and he can counsel us in our, con in our wound and difficulties and heartfelt um, terrible situations that we go through. You know, Jesus can counsel us. In Hebrew chapter 4, we find that because as a human he went through all the temptation, now he can relate with us. He can understand our pain and we can share our heart with him and he comes to help us. Amen? Hallelujah. This is our Jesus who is alive and who is real and who helps us and who counsels us because he is, he became human once. But now when he comes back, he will be ruling as a king and with him we will be ruling and then we will see the fullness of his kingdom the righteousness, peace, and justice, and love everywhere. And I'm so excited when I think of that, and I say, Lord, when are you going to come? Help us to be ready. Help us to make this world ready. Help us to share the good news. Help us to love others so that they will know that the kingdom of Jesus is love and forgiveness and grace and hope and mercy, and there's so much. And we see healing because we see Jesus healing people, and we have confidence to pray into that. And it's because of Jesus' humanity, we can follow him. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just one more story and I stop. Some years ago, we had a guy called Alvin, and he was put on a course so that he would not go to school. And at first, it was even hard for us to believe, even though we see uh, in manifestation of many kinds in our culture. And we pray for people and they get delivered because of in the name of Jesus we do that. But for this particular case, it was unbelievable for us as well. And the parents had collected 1,200 small and bigger nails that had come to hit their son. And when we were praying for him, we had one couple from Maidenhead staying in, in Nepal for a few weeks. And it was the time they had to go back. And I was like, you are going back. You are, you know, we always see people from here more knowledgeable and uh, supporting us. They pray for us, and I see more healing when f friends come and visit us. And I was like, Pastor Colin, you're going back, and the boy is not healed yet. He's still in trauma, and he still hasn't been able to go to school. And that pastor said, Susma, Jesus is with you. He will help you. It's not us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit. Trust in him. And they went, and they came back to England. And I was like, we left in the battle alone. Milan and me and our small church. And we didn't know what to do. We trusted in the Lord and we prayed and we fasted. We needed to do that because all village knew that we were praying in this house. And the young boy, 11 years old, nine months he hasn't been to school. One witch doctor died treating him. The evil spirit killed him. And many people came to try to help him. Nobody could help him. And it was the church now involved in that um, issues. And everybody were looking. And I was like, Lord, What's going to happen? You have to manifest your presence. You have to do something. You kill me or heal, heal him. That was my foolish prayer, but it was the prayer of faith, I tell you. And you know, after a few weeks, his mother called us because every morning we used to go, him, go to him and take him to the school because otherwise the evil spirit would just not let him go. And one morning his mother said, Susma, you don't have to come to our house anymore. Today... I am taking a step of faith, and I am taking my son to school myself, and the nails has not come today since the morning. So let us do the prayer. And she did, and from that day on, no nails. And he was healed, delivered, and he continued his education. And actually, that guy is in America now, studying in the university. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And this is our Jesus. And we can follow that example because he did it as a human being. And thank you so much for listening. And I just want to pray one minute. Let's close our eyes. Father God, I thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, I thank you for revealing yourself, not as a son of God, but you prefer to say son of man.
You identified yourself with us, but you were perfect without sin, and you became our sacrifice. You became the promised one. You became the one who overcome the evils, and you have won the battle, Lord, and we wait for that day to be in your presence. But for now, Lord, I ask you, Holy Spirit, to come in our hearts, in our minds, in our families, in our nation. And Lord, help us to be the royal priesthood, the chosen nation, the chosen people, so that we may follow you in the path that you have walked and see the wonders that you have said you will, you will do in my name because you made it possible. Amen. I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for my brothers and sisters here, Lord, they are going through different persecutions, different kinds of struggle in life. And Father, I pray that in every situation, they would be able to follow you, speak life in their lives, speak light as you would do. And Lord, your strength and your mercy be upon every family and every individual here, that we may see your glory dwell in and through us. I love you, Jesus. Thank you for coming in our world and saving us. Thank you for the hope that you give us. Thank you. We love you, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.